What does it mean to be a student? I suppose I could poll the audience, but my tried and tested is go to the Oxford English Dictionary, right? So what do I find if I look there? It's not so much the definition of student, but what its form is. Studere, the Latin verb to devote oneself to, is if you conjugate it in the first person, present indicative, singular, studeo. So here you get a studio, a one-person apartment which is made for studying. You also have a cot probably in the corner. Or if it's present participle, student, present, active, I am studying, student. So it's a tough job, especially when your job is doubled and you're a student athlete or a student worker or a student who's also a parent and we're also siblings and, and the list goes on, student slash. So, how do we build all of those things together? I want to look at Philippians 4 with its six commands in verses 4 through 9 that Miranda read so well and look at how the command to think seriously, to study, fits with the other commands that we have in the Christian life. One way that I think about studying is to think of it as a place. Maybe for you that's the library, maybe it's the desk. For me, it's my study, and I insist on calling it this. Um, my wife and kids call it the office in many cases, but I call it the study, because that's what I do there. And yet, and you know this, oh, could we go back just one, one bit so you can see this study? I took this photograph of it this morning when I walked in. And then the kids come in and ruin my study, as it were. Could we go forward one slide and then, oh, okay, so for some reason I thought I had brought one on top of the other, but not showing up that way. Anyway, I took a photograph of my study this morning and then superimposed one of my kids on top of it, because that's what usually happens. Right, they come in, bang, open the door, <laughs> there goes my study. While I'm reading exams and so on, really important things. So how do I... And I am a student too, because I am actively studying. How do I put together studying with the distractions that come in? Philippians 4 8, which Miranda read earlier. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy, these are the things that excite us to think excite us to study, to be the students that we are. But why? Beyond this list of interesting things to look at, why should we think? Well, first of all, God created us to do that. Genesis 2, he brings the animals to Adam to see what Adam would call them. So Adam has to process these thousands of different species thinking. Another reason Thinking prepares us for whatever. I started to fill in the blank and then realized it would be too long for the slide. But Psalm 4, verse 4, commune within your own heart upon your bed and be still. It's great advice, especially for break. Just lie on my bed. <laughs> but I was doing that this morning and thinking of this verse, and then I got up and shoveled the driveway. So this is preparation for what comes next, thinking. It also defines us. Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. It's also how we love God. When Christ responds to the Pharisee, what is the greatest commandment in the law? It is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So these are all reasons for us to think and to think well. But we often don't get the time or the space to do this in life. So it is amazing that society has recognized four years of a person's life beyond what the government requires that you can be a student and nobody will push that. 
Maybe I started to push it myself and started to take more part-time jobs than was useful to me when I was a student. But at least society recognizes that these are four or three years more if you're doing graduate study, that we have a space and a time carved out for it. These are reasons for thinking. I suppose one more is we want to progress in it. What is thinking? It's, uh, I put up four sort of binaries. While on the one hand, I'm attending to an object, biology, I'm studying prokaryotic cells or eukaryotic cells, thanks Dr. Hopow. Um, or, you know, well, pick your subject. But I'm also pa um, dealing with distractions, not just my kids who come in, but my own thoughts that are wandering around. And so studying is the process of integrating each distraction into a continuous stream of attention. It's at least one way for me to think of it, is not to push all the distractions away, but to find, all right, God, what did you want me to learn from this distraction that I just had? Was it this last moment that I would have otherwise skipped past, but now I have to look at it because I got distracted in the middle of it? So when I'm playing with my kids down in the basement, I think of that last poem that I read, which I otherwise might have downplayed. It's also a, something that can be passive and active. Of course, we say, I think, but we also say, a thought occurred to me. And it can be, as we think, both transitive, I think a thought, but also intransitive. These are different states of the verb. That is, I think, period. And that is a really self-reflective kind of awareness. So that thinking is not just knowing something that's out there, it's also becoming more aware of who we are. One more I thought of is it's both temporal, I learn things that are true of this life, but also eternal. Well, that has a, a line in the second book of Paradise Lost, the thoughts that wander through eternity. And I hope when I get to eternity, I find some of my thoughts still wandering around out there. Sometimes if I don't, you know, this occurs to me when I haven't gotten enough sleep lately and my thoughts aren't wandering very far at all. Certainly not getting to eternity. So these are some reasons to think and some features that thinking includes. But let's take another hard look at the passage in Philippians because, as I said, it's going to help us know what thinking looks like when it's in conversation with the other commands here. Beginning with rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Why does this one come first in the set of six commands? And one easy answer is it's the theme of the book of Philippians. It's one that Paul returns to 14 times. We have cognates of this word. For instance, just in chapter 1, he begins with a prayer to the Philippians saying, in all my prayers for you, I always pray with joy. Verse 18 of the same chapter. The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. And then in verse 25, again, this is just the first chapter of the letter, he writes, I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So as Paul gets to the end of his letter, he starts this peroration, or a summing up of all that he said before by returning to this keynote of the letter, rejoice. The second one is a tempering of the first. Let your gentleness be known to all people. And I say it's tempering it because it's not just taking exuberance and modifying it potentially, but it's also the verb voices that are saying this. That The first command is active second person imperative. You rejoice. The second command here is, and I think this is what's fascinating about studying other languages, you learn they have categories that we don't have in English. In English, we do not have a third person imperative. You don't say, he, do something. <laughs> But in effect, that's what the Greek offers here. And it's sort of like what I just did. He, you're looking at something other than what you're pointing at. He, do something. It's, so it's a little less direct, and it's also passive voice. This is another thing that English doesn't do very well, is passive imperatives. So that's why the translation here is, let your gentleness be evident. 
but what control do we have over that? It's one thing to be gentle, but how do we make our gentleness evident to everybody? That really depends on everybody else seeing the gentleness. So there's an interplay of verbs here that Paul uses to structure all six of them. We start with an active, we move to a passive imperative, which is what he does in the next two as well. Okay, we got all of them here. And I already got the Greek in there. Okay, so, <laughs> so this is a review if you're in Dr. Mulder or Dr. Raquel's class. Do not be anxious about anything. This is the only command of the six that's a negative. And it's not that we shouldn't, I mean, Paul's talking, you know, pardon, it seems as if Paul wants both ways. Because in chapter two of Philippians, he uses the same word, which is translated cares or worry, and he says to Timothy, who is going to look after the church in Philippi, he will care for you. And it's the same word. So here he's, he's saying into the context of these other commands, don't be anxious, at least not to the point that interrupts your prayer life. Instead, as I was saying with this constant stream of attention, pulling distractions into it, it's not that we shouldn't worry, at all, not that we shouldn't think about things, insofar as that's worry, but don't let that inhibit the prayer, instead let it drive the prayer. And so that's where the positive command comes in. In every situation, this is a motif of this rejoice always, in every situation, let your gentleness be known to all. Paul is totalizing here every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving present your requests to God. This is a tricolon crescendo. It's tricolon. There are three nouns to describe the action of praying. Prayer, then petition, and finally requests to God. And there's a kind of rhetorical emphasis on that last of the three. It's a rhetorical device in classical Greek, and Paul's using it here, to emphasize these requests, which is a word that Christ never uses, at least so far as I've been able to find. It can be request, that's a gentle connotation of it, but it's also used in the classical period, at least, as a demand. I want this, I need it. So there is an emphasis that grows across these three descriptions of prayer. Now, so far, I've just been walking through these different commands, but why is it that rejoice comes first? Okay, that's the, th that's the keynote of the passage. Then we're tempering it with let your gentleness be known. The next two I see as a build-up to the command to think. Don't worry. Do not be anxious. Instead, pray. How is that a prelude to thinking? thinking toward God. Prayer presupposes thought. Without thought, we don't have prayer. You don't just turn the wheel and that constitutes a prayer. You can't, it, it involves our minds. So this order of the commands is very specific, building toward thinking and to what follows after that. Not that prayer is somehow a way station or a route to somewhere else, but that it does, when we pray, focus our mind and make us better able to think well. It's like a snowplow comes through, cuts away that path so that we can then think more carefully. And when I have a really important piece of thinking to do, or even if it's just Run of the mill every day thinking, I pray, God help me know how to think. And I've taken that inspiration from these verses as I've been studying them. Verse 7 also shows some part of the connection between praying and thinking. The peace of God which surpasses understanding, an emphasis on the mind, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And um, if we could advance the slide once, I'll just, I just wanted to point out the two words of the understanding and the mind are just cognates of the same word. 
So there is an emphasis as Paul moves from this prayer command to the command to think. He's building this connection that our God is the one who comforts our minds, the God of peace the, that's named at verse 9. Here is the peace of God, which transcends all understanding. So it's not a kind of power play where we say, I'm going to think today. But we look to God as the one who passes everything we could possibly think and say, what do you want me to think today? And that's our grid. And there are no, there's another grid that Paul puts in place in a really deliberate way. He lists eight qualities that should be focusing our thought. There is a six and then a two, and the construction plays out that there's um, rhetorically asyndeton. There's no and, true and honorable, and noble, and right. There's no, there's no and there. It's just boom, boom, boom. These are the things to think about. It's very emphatic as we move through this list of six qualities, and then there's a little addendum, which is indicated in the NIV with a, a long dash, an M dash. But looking at these eight qualities shows us how we can measure our studies here how we can measure the way those studies affect the way we will think for the rest of our lives. When I was just entering puberty, my father gave this verse to me, which I'd already memorized, but he said, when you feel temptation, and he was referring to sexual temptation, think of this verse and use it as a way of processing those temptations, those distractions, and of putting your mind on things that are true noble, right. That's sometimes about as far as I would ever get in pushing those things away, but just thinking about the verse and having this command to come back to was a way of pushing away those temptations. This word, um, whatever is right, sounds really generic and perhaps that's appropriate. Many of these terms are. But it's a word that in the New Testament can also be translated just. The, the word dike has both that public justice connotation and the more private righteousness, not that righteousness is always private, but has both connotations. And it's a word that has a long history in classical literature. Uh, for instance, when I was teaching the play, um, The Libation Bearers earlier this semester in studies in drama, we have an exam there today, so <laughs> sore topic, but um, more on that later. When we were t working through this play, there's an emphasis on justice. And so I asked the question, what is justice? And we dealt with that for part of the class period. And then we looked at a metaphor halfway through the play in which justice is described as an anvil planted steady and fate, the swordsmith, pounds out the bronze. Can we? Yeah, thanks, Alyssa. Great. It's looking at justice as something that is so solid that you can hammer out swords on it. That's the imagery that's in the background of this term that Paul's using here. That what we should look for, oh, can we go one more? That'll get us to the citation I just gave from Agam, um, Agamemnon. Yeah. Thanks. The rest of these commands continue for about two, two more of these commands emphasize what is right, that is what is pure, what is noble. But then we get to a series of softer qualities, what is lovely, what is admirable. And here the list starts to feel, at least I would think, to a first century Christian, a little bit less familiar. Both of these words, prosphile and euphema, are hapax legomena. There is, they don't appear anywhere else in the New Testament, and the first of them doesn't even appear in the Septuagint. Although they have long histories, prosphile, for instance, is Homeric, and I mean, who knows what was before that. But 
we're getting to a really generic perspective here so that Paul is not saying to be a Christian and to think, you have to think only about this really constricted set of criteria. I think he's here opening things up a bit, and to me, this helps answer the question, uh, what about football? What about baseball? And I was thinking about this question when I was teaching Homer's Odyssey in Studies in Fiction earlier this semester, and I came across this word, arete, which is the word translated whatever is excellent, in book eight, when Odysseus happens among the Phaeacians, and they're trying to explain what's great about their civilization. Zeus has given us two certain skills, and here's the word, aretes, the one that Paul uses to mean excellent. And what are these skills? We have possessed from our father's time to the present day. Though our boxing and wrestling are not outstanding, which apparently means boxing and wrestling could be arete. So that meant for me, all right, football's back on the table, and baseball, and especially baseball. <laughs> so, it's not that everything about these is worth thinking about, but if it also is noble, well, I guess that means the World Series, and if it's right, so there's a set of criteria, and we, as students, have a responsibility to God to find for our mind what checks the most boxes. I mean, not to think of it as a box only, but to say, God, if you want me to think about what is true and noble and right and pure and lovely and admirable and excellent and praiseworthy, just use the process of thinking through those qualities to purify the mind. It's a meta comment. The the fact that we're working through Scripture right now is a kind of putting us on track to be thinking what is true and noble. And then, as I said, prayer is a, can be a kind of snowplow to drive away the distractions or at least integrate them into our thought. Thought, in the sequence of these six commands, becomes a way of preparing for action. That's where the last command comes in. What you have learned, received, heard, and seen, put into practice. And in the next slide, it's even more clear that these two verbs are paired. So that these two last commands, think and do, are the last words in their respective verses in the original. So it, Paul is emphasizing thinking prepares the way for, think, uh, for acting or for practicing, which is even more long goal-oriented than just acting in the present. And it's thinking that br is the middle, it's the bridge between prayer and action, at least as Paul is presenting it here in this passage. And so what kind of thinking do we do? What kind of thinking could we do that would be more pleasing to God? As students, workers, Teachers, student teachers, readers of scripture, caregivers, observers of God's world, we learn in praying to think, in thinking to pray, in doing to pray, and thus in thinking to do. The process of working through a text carefully, why this set of commands, why this order, why are these commands here in this letter? This careful attention gets us ready to dialogue with God, and it is our dialogue with God. If all Scripture be inspired by God, then all the organization of it is God's organization too. And we can make our minds more like His by studying, being a student of His thought patterns. May we become more pure, holy, and generous like God by studying what is true and noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, 
excellent and praiseworthy and seeking to understand him as he created us to do with our minds.